it's Flo, and this is my impression of a traveling lounge singer. And we're going up the airport escalator. Hey, where are you from? Ha <laughs> ha, no response. Classic. Got an accident, so you gotta take a cab, huh? No cabs at Progressive Service Centers. They got rental cars on site, which is out of sight, you know? <laughs> Progressive takes the hassle out of claims. Just drop your car off at one of our service centers, and we'll manage the rest. Here's a little number I like to call. Waiting for the shuttle bus. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company. Service centers not available in all areas. You have a choice of repair facilities. Blog Talk Radio. Have you been searching for a conservative talk radio show that covers the issues you are interested in? Well, search no more. That show is Stand for Truth Radio, and I'm your host, Susan Knowles. We'll be talking about all the issues that matter to you. Our guests are political figures, military men and women, best-selling authors, and even political conservative comedians. So join us every Monday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern on WNJC 1360 AM and Stand for Truth. for the Stand for Truth radio show at SusanKnowles.com. And before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone who is carrying our radio show. We're now heard on WNJC 1360 AM, freedom in dependentpress.com, and shrmedia.com. So tonight's topic is going to be one that I think that we're all sort of getting very familiar with. You know, you only have to listen to the news very briefly, and you will understand that Christianity is under attack. You know, from Hillary Clinton's latest speech on, you know, where she said, well, we've got to get rid of deep-seated culture and religious beliefs, to seeing the videos of ISIS beheading the Coptic Christians in Egypt and also the beheadings in America. And it's not only Christians that are being persecuted. Christians and Jews are being persecuted. And we're going to talk all about it with our returning guest, Joel Richardson, tonight. Uh, And he's going to also be talking to us about his new book. He has a new book out called When a Jew Rules the World, What the Bible Really Says About Israel in the Plan of God. Joel is a New York Times bestselling author, filmmaker, and internationally recognized teacher. Joel's heart is thoroughly missional with a special love for all the peoples of the Middle East. And he has a passion to see Jesus known throughout the region. Joel travels and teaches on the gospel, living with biblical hope and the return of Jesus. He is the author, editor, and director of many books and documentaries, including End Times Eyewitness, The Global Jesus Revolution, Mideast Beast, and Islamic Antichrist. Joel has also been featured or written for numerous radio, television, and news outlets across the world, including The Glenn Beck Show, Mike Huckabee Show, Gordon Liddy Show, Dennis Miller, 
Jewish Voice Today, the New York Daily News, WND, The Blaze, Front Page Magazine, and on and on and on. So without uh, further ado, I want to welcome back to the show. Joel, welcome back to the show. Susan, it's great to be back on with you. Great. I'm so glad that you're here. I I want to, you know, I want to talk about your book and, and, and sort of bring it into what's going on in current events. But before we get started, I wanted to, for the viewers that weren't on last time, I want to uh, ask you a little bit about your ministry that you do, you know, when it got started and how long you've been doing it and, and basically what your ministry is about. Sure. <clears throat> well, you know, it goes back to really shortly after I came to faith at age 19 back in the, uh, 1991. And, you know, there was a missionary that had come to our church and he told us about the Islamic world and how there were not many Christian missionaries that were really going to the Islamic world, yet they needed the gospel more than anyone else. And so all the way back then I had committed my life to uh, the Muslim world and to uh, trying to share the, the good news uh, concerning Jesus and, and the Father's love for Muslims. And um, really, I call myself a failed missionary because you know, back then I had my five-year plan, and um, I spent most of 94 between Israel, Egypt, and Jordan, and then I came back to the Midwest. I was going to school, and, and life happened. You know, I met my wife, and, and really, so throughout the 90s, I was just reaching out to Muslims locally, We've got, you know, millions of Muslims here in the United States, and I was doing that. And uh, after 9-11, things really shifted to trying to alert the West concerning the real nature of Islam. And, you know, Susan, I'll tell you, I, I've been doing that for some years now, traveling, speaking in churches, trying to educate the church and, and different uh, military, religious groups. I really think that the United States has reached the point where we're polarized to the point where either you're in denial concerning Islam or you're pretty well aware of the reality. And so while I continue to try to educate the church regarding Islam, the, the shift now in really many ways is I'm trying to wake up the church to learn how to love Muslims. Because I, I really almost feel as though it's gone so far where Christians are aware of how evil Islam is but there, there really can be a lot of fear and even hatred in the church among Christians. And so I really believe that those that want to be followers of Jesus, if they want to be imitators of Jesus, uh, they really need to learn how to love and reach out to Muslims because that is the only issue that's really going to change anything. In the end, military and political solutions will fail. And so this is really what I'm about, is trying to help bring the love of God to the Muslim world. And and you are, I mean, that is a really a, a good thing to, um, a good mission and a good ministry, but it, it is, as I'm sure that you're well aware of, a very kind of uphill battle these days because of all that we see in the news and of all that is happening and, and how frightened people are about ISIS and what is going on. And I, I know that people know that that's radical Islam and it's not uh, what the majority of Muslims perhaps are, are like, but to try to change that image uh, when we're seeing that every day is going to be a difficult task. You know, it is. And because, you know, the news is such that, you know, the, the old, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and people, you know, you don't turn on the evening news and hear a lot of wonderful good news. It's just not the nature of news. And so as a result of that, yeah, even in the church, people are afraid. And people, there's, as crisis uh, spreads around the earth, as bloodshed continues, then tribalism uh, expands. And so really we develop this us versus them mentality we put people in groups and we relate to them, you know, from the perspective of stereotypes. And it, it, there's no room for that among Christians to, to give themselves over to tribalism because the fact of the matter is Muslims are as different as people are different. And, uh, you know, yes, Islam is evil and it, it has the potential to infect the souls of mankind and, and draw the worst in people out. But again, you know, I was just in northern Iraq just a few months ago, and I think we talked about this. You know, among the Kurdish people, they're all Muslims, but when I'm in the 
uh, in the market and I'm buying some bread or fruit, they literally wouldn't accept any money for anything that I wanted to buy. They would, they would refuse to accept payment. No, please, you take it because they love Americans and they're a very moderate Muslims. So, you know, it's not to say there's not some radical Kurds, but, you know, every individual and every group is different around the world, and, and we, rarely, we rarely get in touch with that. That's absolutely true, and I, I think you're right. We do need to see, you know, the good along with the bad and have a sort of a balanced opinion about things instead of a one-sided opinion that we typically get in the news. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit now about your book, When a Jew Rules the World. Um, we, we you know, we hear a lot about how America should support Israel. We learn about that in the Bible, and we see strong support. But we don't see, you know, really strong support today among, especially young people, let's say on cal, uh, college campuses that have sort of been influenced um, by, you know, anti-Semitism. So I want to know one of the the main reasons many are challenging the biblical support for Israel these days. Well, you know. The answer really can be summarized in what's called Gentile arrogance, which is to say that going all the way back to the very beginning of the church, Paul the Apostle warned, and the reason that he made such a strong warning uh, was because he knew the propensity of people to fall into this. And so in Romans 11, Paul warned the Gentile Christians who were being grafted into this, this metaphorical olive tree called Israel and he says, listen, if you've been graciously grafted in, don't look down in arrogance upon those that have been rejected because of unbelief. And yet really down through the history of the church, the majority have embraced arrogance, and thus they have embraced a theology known as replacement theology. And this is the idea that the church is the new or the true spiritual Israel, but we've replaced Israel. And really the, the spiritual Israel is the truest uh, Israel, and this is the idea that's been held down to the history of the church. Well, really, in the early 1800s, you had a group known as the Plymouth Brethren, and uh, they came out of uh, out of Ireland and really spread all across the uh, the world. And today, those that came out of that movement make up much of the, uh, the the Baptists and the Pentecostals throughout the earth today, and they tend to have a very pro-Israel stance. Well, now there's this, you know, typical pendulum swinging in the other direction. And many of these young seminarians, these young college kids that are going to school, they are taking the approach that this is their father's kind of approach to religion. They're rejecting uh, an emphasis on the end times. They're rejecting support for Israel, and they are buying into the propaganda the pro-Palestinian nationalist, Arab nationalist propaganda, and really ultimately embracing and supporting a lot of truly racist and perverted narrative concerning the state of Israel. And this is really becoming incredibly popular. And when we talk about replacement theology, can we get into a little bit about, you know, the promise that God made to the people of Israel and why the theory doesn't seem to really jive? Yeah, well, I mean, it's very simple. You go back to the very beginning of the Bible, the very foundation of God's unfolding promise plan, and God himself, you know, he had Abram at the time, before his name was changed to Abraham, he had Abram cut these animals in half, a, you know, a bull and a ram and, you know, a few birds, and he, he's got all these animals cut in half, and God himself walks in between these animals that have been cut in half, and the purpose of this in ancient Near Eastern tradition is the, the, the an actor of the covenant is essentially saying, God himself was saying, may I, God, Almighty, die like these animals if I don't fulfill and keep my promises. And then God went ahead and promised to give the descendants of Abraham the promised land. And he delineated it in very specific parameters from the sea, the river of Egypt, to the great sea, to, you know, from here to there. And he, he lays it out with an incredible amount of specificity. And today, those that embrace replacement theology say, well, God's not interested in real estate. He's expanded this universally. His plan has never been limited by some piece of land. 
And they literally are accusing God of being a promise breaker and saying that he changed his mind. He never intended to give them the lamb. This was all just a, a metaphor for something far greater, which of course doesn't make any sense because if it was merely a metaphor, then why would he have been so specific in delineating the boundaries? And really what we learn as we go forward in the scriptures is that, yes, God's plan of redemption is much larger than just the, the, the piece of land and he's going to bring in the, all of the Gentiles. He's going to redeem all of creation. But the promised land is the very platform and the foundation from which that plan of redemption will be carried out. And so, yes, God is very concerned with real estate. And, and to say anything else is truly to pervert the clear teachings of the Bible. And, and I'm glad that you brought it up too because I think it goes beyond just the real estate and that is that you know God said these are his chosen people and so why would he then just say oh whoops you know I was just kidding you know take it all back so it, it goes beyond just the land and everything else it, it, it is God declaring my you know his promise to these people and you know, we're incorporated into that from, you know, from the New Testament and all that. But, I mean, it goes back sort of to the roots of it is that God chose Israel, you know, as the chosen people. Is that not correct? Yeah, and, you know, and what's amazing is that throughout the scriptures, and, and off the top of my head, I don't remember the number of times, but it's hundreds of times. In fact, one of the most overwhelmingly common names that God gives himself throughout the scriptures is the God of Israel. And Mm -hmm. so now you have these, again, Gentile Christians that come along and say, the God of Israel has rejected Israel. I mean, this is, if we understand the biblical story in the context of the Bible, this really is an absurdity, and it it is an indictment against the very integrity of the God of the Bible that they claim to worship, because in the same way that God is choosing to use this piece of property as the foundation, the platform, to carry out his plan of redemption, he has chosen a particular people as well. And as much as we don't like to admit it, when we understand that God's plan, God himself is very clearly an ethnicist. And, you know, while we're talking about the subject of Israel and and supporting Israel, uh, is America, do you think, uh, turning her back on Israel now as they're negotiating with Iran, uh, and this nuclear weapons treaty is that what do you what's your opinion on that well you know it's it's really a phenomenon in terms of what's taking place because you know we can debate all day long whether or not president obama is a secret muslim that's trying to enact this evil plan to cause you know sharia law and you know all the is he the manchurian candidate or is he simply a radical leftist whose incompetence is leading and i i really I lean towards seeing him much more through the lens of Dinesh D'Souza. He's this radical anti-colonialist. He's been infected uh, and influenced by, you know, the the, the communist uh, sort of um, stepfather that he grew up with, as well as his Muslim upbringing in Indonesia. He's been affected by all of these things. But it really is human nature that when we see a threat coming over the horizon, albeit in World War II or today, it really is human nature to fall into denialism. And so here we have this clear, looming threat with declarations of we are going to wipe you out, we are going to carry out a genocide, we're going to eliminate a nation. You know, and right now, just in the past few days, we've had generals in Iran saying, we are going to go to war with America. And the very same politicians, including Barack Obama, who are negotiating and in the process of negotiating with Iran, they won't even mention or acknowledge these statements. That is clearly denialism. Uh, Because really, if we say that it's all part of this evil plan to cause Islam to be supreme throughout the world, then we have a problem because we say, well, which is he, a Sunni or a Shia? Because the bottom line is he's propping both of them up. You know, his policies are propping up the Sunnis and the Shia. And so it it simply isn't logical, but the the, the end result is that he is clearly antagonistic toward the more conservative party in Israel, i.e. the party that's going to protect them and and, and ensure their security while empowering some of the most genocidal apocalyptic 
Looney Tune regimes in the earth, and the end result is that you know, I, and I I don't mean to be crass, but to use you know Michael Savage's statement, uh, liberalism is a, is a mental disorder, and it, it literally causes people to do things that are just completely irrational. Well, it's like you say, it is very confusing because at the same time we're sitting down negotiating with Iran, who is chanting death to America and basically is is more than likely financially supporting the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, we are at the same time you know, working with Saudi Arabia uh, to protect, to give them to the support, you know, to, to help quash the, the, the Houthis in Iran. So it's like, you know, and if what we're doing in Iran can affect Saudi Arabia detrimentally and, and the Muslims there. So it, it is such a hard and confusing thing for people you know, in Saudi Arabia, Iran, and probably and, and the United States to kind of understand why it's all being done because really none of it makes that much sense. Uh, uh, also, you talk in your book about an alter- alternative to the replacement theology, and, and it's called restorationism. Explain what that's about. Yeah, and this is something that is the joy of my heart to talk about, which is to say that you have much of the church that says that God is done with Israel, and that the church is the new and true Israel. And then as an alternative to that perspective is the term restorationism, which is summarized in the idea that when Jesus comes back, and this is not preached in the churches, but this is preached throughout the scriptures, throughout the Bible, when he comes back, he will restore the kingdom of Israel. And this is exactly what the... The apostles, the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, listen, it's not for you to know the times, you know, but go and make disciples of all nations. You know, he he says, listen, just go do this. And at the time, at the proper time, it will take place. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes back uh, at the restoration of all things, and he says to the disciples, you'll sit on 12 thrones and you'll judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, this is, you know, a thoroughly Jewish picture. And so when you look at the story, when you look at the picture that all of the biblical prophets, Jesus, John the Baptist, all of the disciples were proclaiming, that they were proclaiming the biblical hope, the focal point of the entire Bible is that Jesus returns, the righteous are resurrected, and there is a restored earth over which will be ruling a a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish king, and uh, and will be ruling over a restored Jewish kingdom, and at the center of which will be a rebuilt temple. And, you know, all of these things which have have such a thoroughly, uh, you know, Jewish characteristics to them, and again, replacement theology purges biblical hope of, of this very of these very Jewish characteristics and thus really pervert and and neuter news, you know, because when Jesus proclaimed the good news, he was simply reiterating the same story that all of the prophets were proclaiming and, and we really we do the Bible and we do the gospel a great injustice when we when we truncate and try to, you know, do away with all of these these aspects of the gospel which testify to the faithfulness of who God is. Do you think that we're beginning to see that restoration occurring? Um, that's a good question. And the answer is yes and no. We are seeing, uh, you know, many Jews who are coming to faith in Messiah. There's no question about that. And so these are the, the signs of, of what is yet to come. And we've seen Israel be restored, so there's a degree to which you could say. But, you know, when you look at Jesus' sermon on the on Mount of Olives, it was his sermon on the end times, the Olivet Discourse, it really was, in many ways, a radical argument for a divine, supernatural inbreaking of God that will happen suddenly at the day of the Lord, as opposed to the expectation of the first century Jews, which was for an insurrectionist movement that would rise up and through the strength of the flesh, through the strength of man, would establish the kingdom of God on the earth. This is why he said, listen, 
Many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah. Don't listen to them. If you hear, you know, hey, there's these guys in the inner rooms, don't go after them. If you hear there's this group gathering out in the desert, you know, they're raising up an insurrectionist movement, don't go after them. And so in many ways, and, and again, you know, I'm as Israel, I, I, we need to stand with Israel, but there is a dimension to where the modern state of Israel is trying to establish that which only Jesus can establish through the strength of the flesh. And, and so there's a, you know, there's a, a divine conundrum that the Lord has orchestrated, you know, because only he will truly restore that kingdom. In the meantime, the Jewish people are commanded to steward the promises uh, but in doing that, they're also called to thoroughly obey all of Torah, which means, you know, truly blessing the stranger that's in your midst. And so, you know, Israel's in this position of having all these these strangers that live amongst them, and the majority of them want to wipe the Jewish people out. So, you know, as I said, the Lord has really put this divine conundrum into place, and he will squeeze everyone. He will test the hearts of everyone before it's all said and done. And this really is what's beginning to unfold in our midst, which is the divinely orchestrated controversy over Zion that is going to become the great burdensome stone for all of the nations. Now, I'm kind of looking at, you know, this whole scenario, you know, about end times. I know we're just speaking a little bit about it, but, I mean, do you feel that we're seeing the end times beginning are we there and i i want to bring out a couple of examples of why i'm asking you know we see that race relations today um are pro, in you know in ferguson and baltimore um and and recently in a, in a speech that michelle obama gave at uh, tuskegee university you know it, it race relations has basically just been you know taken back to the to the 1960s era and a lot of people are looking at that and going, you know, everything is just so upside down. It's, you know, we were going along, it seemed to be pretty nice, and, and all of a sudden the world is kind of upside down. These are just some examples. But, you know, then we have, like I said, ISIS before, and different things are happening, things that used to make sense no longer really make sense. Is that part of, of being in the end times? Well, let me let me say this. Um with social media, uh, largely because of social media, I believe that riots, protests, and even full-blown revolutions will quickly become the new form of global youth entertainment. And so whether it's race issues in the United States or you know any number of other issues, riots, protests, and revolutions are going to continue to increase and spread all over the globe. Um, and so I would see that, yes, as a sign of the end times. Global unrest, civil wars will erupt because none of these things ever truly produce the fruit. Uh, they never produce good fruit. Whenever it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, it just it snowballs into you know, meaninglessness. And so, you know, but the thing of it is, is the, the potential for major race issues in the United States is huge, but I'm going to, I'm going to shock you. You know, I actually read, uh, Michelle Obama's speech and I actually really sympathized with what she had to say. And, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, which is tribalism is the, the crazier things get, you know, the more that we see riots in the streets, we see police being shot, the easier it is to start going, you know, to, to kind of fall into this mindset of us versus them. And so when you hear, you know, an, an African-American woman like Michelle, who really lays out the, the reality of what it, it is for... Now, again, you know, you, yeah, we have to be careful because you can overblow this, but for what it is like for many African-Americans to live day-to-day, -day, and, and they do face little prejudices day-to-day, -day, and it stings, and she, that's really all she laid out. Now, timing is not great, but what happens is, you know, those that are not African-American Caucasians or the majority, they hear that and they think, we need to go back to when everything, when we didn't talk about these things as much. But the feelings really have always been there. And so, you know, 
the days ahead are going to require Christians, uh, it's going to require us to, to really enter into a profound spirit of reconciliation and refusal to enter into that us versus them tribalism because the fear is going to explode. Now, that, I know that's kind of a side issue. To me, the issue, the signs of the times of the end times are primarily in the Middle East. When I see events unfolding throughout the Middle East, then, then my answer is yes. The general contours of the landscape as described by the prophets, the specific geopolitical alliances, are coming clearly into focus. And again, these things can carry for another 5, 10, 15 years. I mean, it, the, the years have a way of rolling on. But really, the, the, the geopolitical uh, chessboard described by the prophets in the last days, since the Arab Spring, no thanks to Barack Obama's disastrous foreign policy throughout the Middle East, is coming into focus, and it really is, and, and lift up their heads, because, it, you know, it really is coming upon us. And can you tell us a little bit, I know it's it's involved, but can you tell us a little bit about what you see in the Middle East that makes you think that? Sure. I mean, there's any number of things, but like, for instance, let me just, just give you one example. Um, in Daniel chapter 11, it describes the Antichrist as being a last days, um, sort of a last days Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, uh, or Antiochus Epiphanes was the ruler of the Seleucid dynasty. And so this was a or uh, the Seleucid Empire, which, which controlled much of modern-day Turkey, Syria, Iraq, extending all the way over into western Iran. And so there was this whole sort of empire throughout that region. And the Antichrist is described as an individual that comes from out of that region. Ezekiel describes the Antichrist as coming probably from the region of Turkey. So we're looking at that sort of, I, I jokingly refer to it as the tri-state area, you know, Turkey, Syria, <laughs> Iraq, that that sort of uh, that region. And so he comes out of that region, and one of the things that he does is he invades and defeats Egypt. Well, two years ago, if you were pointing to Syria, if you were pointing to Iraq, if you were pointing to Turkey, they were all wonderful allies with Egypt, and, and they had been for you know, 30, 50, 60, 70 years, all of last century, they, were, they had warm relations between Egypt and any of those northern nations. Well, since the Arab Spring, we now have hit, hit this place to where the antagonism between that region, which Daniel 11 refers to as the king of the north, and then the king of the south being Egypt, is, is openly seen. You have President Sisi openly declaring that President Erdogan is a dictator. President Erdogan in Turkey openly declaring that Sisi is a dictator. Of course, you have ISIS, which is would love to see Egypt fall um, because Egypt is a much more moderate nation. So this is what I mean when I say the geopolitical landscape, the contours described by the prophets are coming into focus really in a way that he said for the past 100 years. You also have Israel back in the land. This is a this was the biggest prerequisite for the last days. Well now we're, you know, the past 50, 70 years Israel's been reestablished. Um, and, and in the land. And so now you have all these other elements that are beginning to line up. And that, that's really just one example. You could lay out probably four or five. And so, um, you know, we're not there yet, but you can see it coming into focus. Now, in regards to the Antichrist, there's been a lot of speculation about where the Antichrist will come from. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, again, the... You really have three, I would say, the three strongest passages in the Old Testament, really in the whole Bible, that tell us the region that he will come from is Daniel 8, Daniel 11, and then Ezekiel 38 39. So both Daniel 8 and 11 use the historical character, the Greek ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, as sort of a historical shadow or type. And, uh, and it's not just of his character and his exploits, but also to some degree, the region that he'll come from, because Daniel 11 repeatedly refers to him as the king of the north. And so it uses the term the king of the north to refer to Antiochus, and then it sort of seamlessly shifts into calling the Antichrist the king of the north. 
And so it clearly has geographic connotations. And he comes out, again, out of the region of northern Iraq, Syria, and eastern Turkey. That was the region that he came out of historically. Ezekiel 38:39, which is the prophecy often known as the Battle of Gog and Magog, Many Bible prophecy scholars have, have pointed to that passage and said it's speaking of Russia, um, but it's, they do so using a flawed method of interpretation and identifying the various names that are in the prophecy. When you uh, examine the passage with, without any preconceived you know, end-time perspectives, you just open the Bible atlases. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is pointing to Turkey. And again, so you're you know, whether we're dealing with Turkey, Syria, or Iraq, that general part of the world, um, the, the scriptures are clearly pointing to the, that same general region. And my my guess is that while it doesn't make entire sense now, because we go, well, which is it, Iraq, Syria, or Turkey, there there will be uh, events between now and then that we're, we'll actually see existing national boundaries shift and suddenly there will not be you know, either Turkey or Syria or Iraq. Rather, we'll see something new form, and he'll come out of that region. And what are your thoughts about whether or not, because I know there's a lot of speculation with people and in, in sort of interpreting the Bible, of whether or not Russia will go in with Turkey you know, to invade Israel. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think Russia will. I think, you know, Russia... We, we need to understand Russia's foreign policy is just like the United States. It's just selfish. And the, 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 the problem is, well, probably the same, Russia, is, Russia is, is very arrogant. They think they can use nations as pawns as, um, for, their, for their own objectives. But let, let me put it this way. Could Russia be involved in a multinational Islamic coalition invading Israel. I, I, don't, I don't see that because it doesn't make sense. But I will say this. The prophecy that everyone has pointed to to try to argue that it's Russia is Ezekiel 38, 39. And it's a misinterpretation of that text. And I'll actually explain it very briefly because it's not, it's not okay. that complicated. You have... A list of names in Ezekiel 38. You have you have Gog. He's the leader of this coalition, and he's from Magog, and he's the chief prince of Meshech, Tubal, and then it lists Gomer to Gorma, and then you have um, Persia and and Put and Cush, and so these are the you know the eight names basically that are listed. Some people say there's another name, Rosh, the Rosh. Um, which is the, the Hebrew word for chief or head, Rosh Kodesh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the chief day of the, you know, the new year. And regardless as to how whether Rosh is there or not, how you interpret those names, you really have two options. One is that you try to identify who these peoples were in ancient times and then trace them down through history. Well, you know, Magog, well, then, you know, they started out in Asia Minor, but they migrated into Europe and up around the Black Sea through Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, over to Russia, and then they bred and mixed and married and mingled with, you know, the Scandinavians, and they sweat. Okay, so that's the bloodline, lineage. You're trying to trace them down through history. That's one method of interpretation. The other method is you simply look at the names as they were understood by Ezekiel and his immediate audience, and you locate where they were located in his day, and you simply identify the regions as they were understood by Ezekiel. That is the historical method. That's the responsible method that most biblical scholars would accept. In many of the popular prophecy books, they do this bloodline thing. The problem, Susan, is they'll do it with one or two or even three of the names, but then with all the other names, they'll switch methods and stick with the, the, the historical method. It's almost like a card trick because they're trying to they they're trying to create this idea that it's Russia and all these other nations. If you want to do that historical thing and say, well, Magog became Russia, you have to do it with all the other names. And so, for instance, you have Gomer. Well, Go, the Gomerites became the Gimari, which became the Sumerians, which became, for instance, the Celts and the Gauls. Well, you have all these books talking about the coming Russian invasion of Israel, 
But if you want to be consistent, if you want to be a responsible interpreter of the Bible, you have to say the coming Irish invasion of Israel, and not just Ireland, but pretty much the entire Western world, all of the United States, South America, Australia, they would also all be included. But that doesn't sell prophecy books. That doesn't fit with the political atmosphere of our day. And so no one ever argues that. And I'm not saying that prophecy teachers are malicious. I'm just saying that there's a tendency among people to, uh, to simply follow the traditions of their teachers and, and not do the hard biblical homework. And if you do that, if you open up any number of just uh, solid evangelical Bible atlases, they'll point to Magog, Meshach, Gomer, Tagorma, Asia Minor, Turkey. It's not talking about Russia. Now, what about the fact, since we're on that part of the Bible, a lot of people have interpreted, you know, Revelation as not including America in the end time. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the book of Revelation, it's, it's not really talking so much about any particular region. I mean, you know, again, we need to remember the Bible is and always has been a thoroughly Jerusalem, Israel, and Middle Eastern centric book. You know, it's it, they were all written. You know, in, in every book in the Bible was written either in Israel or some of the surrounding nations, and so the lack of mention of the United States, first and foremost, is because it's simply not about us. <laughs> you know, and so you you know people can say, well, you know, America's not mentioned, and 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 Americans have a problem with this because they don't realize the Bible wasn't written for Americans, and so what they just assume, well, you know. I'm American, and the whole world revolves around us, and thus God's world must revolve around us too. You know, and they don't realize that <laughs> God's world is not, you know, our, our Western perspective. But what what a lot of prophecy teachers do is they go, well, America is not mentioned clearly in prophecy. Therefore, the only option is that it must mean that we get wiped out. And I don't think uh, that's certainly a possibility, but I don't think it's a responsible. Um, answer to why we're not mentioned. I think we're not mentioned because it's not about us. And and, and I think you, it could be fair to say that we, we are diminished and we're not as, as primary as we are now. But just to conclude that we get wiped out, I, I think is irresponsible. And I think your explanation of that should give uh, a lot of people comfort because I know a lot of people really are concerned by that fact and, and they look at it as it's it's just because we get wiped off the planet and, and it can't be any other reason. And I think your explanations should probably give people a lot of comfort in that there are other reasons that we might not be there. One, the top reason, and it sounds like in your opinion being that, you know, this, it, we weren't around at that time and this is about Israel, the Middle East, you know, it's not about us. So that's something, a, a new, I think, perspective to look at it that way. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, Christ's thousand-year reign, can you talk a little bit about what, at what point that occurs in the end times? Yeah, well, so Jesus returns, and he establishes his kingdom, and you know, the, all the prophets are talking about this, but then the book of Revelation specifically mentions a thousand years. Well, a lot of people that are opposed to that idea will say, well, you're basing that idea all on just you know one select passage in the book of Revelation, but it really is built on a larger concept, which is known as chiliasm, which simply means a thousand. But it's based on the idea that God created the heavens and the earth in a seven-day week, and that he also structured history to unfold over a 7,000-year uh, period. And thus, the earth right now is coming close to the end of its 6,000th year and that Jesus would thus rule and, ha and that we would have the Sabbath rest, if you will, for a thousand years. And so the, the idea of Jesus ruling and reigning over the earth, as I said, it's throughout the prophets, but the specific time frame is based, one, on that concept of, this, of the seven-year um, uh, structure of creation, as well as the specific mention of a thousand years, uh, you know, in, at the end there of Revelation 20, um, and then after that time, according to the scriptures, uh, we enter into really what's called, we call, theologians call it the eternal state. 
And so it's really an issue of the Lord sort of phasing in to that his ultimate plan, which is where God would dwell with man uh, on the earth, but it's really when heaven and earth, in, in essence, become one, and his original plan was that his creation, those of us that say yes to him, repent of our sins, and say yes to him, will have the opportunity to live and dwell in perfect fellowship with our creator for all of eternity. And the thousand-year reign is sort of that final transition into that eternal state. Now let's talk a little bit about the subject of the rapture. I mean, there there are some people, uh, Christians, that don't believe that there's a rapture at all. There are others that are pre-trib and post-trib. Can you kind of explain um, kind of where you are or what your opinion is on that? Sure. Well, one of the things earlier I mentioned, the Plymouth Brethren, and they they sort of revived a, a uh, face value literal hermeneutic with regard to interpreting the Bible. Hermeneutic is just the science of interpreting the scriptures. And so they simply took scripture for what it says. It says what it means, means what it says. And um, and they recovered, you know, a lot of the ideas that you and I have been talking about. But one of the ideas that they were divided over was the timing of the rapture. And the rapture is the, the moment when the righteous receive their resurrected bodies and were changed from these decaying bodies of death, as Paul calls them, and we receive our immortal bodies. And so many Christians taught that that would happen seven years before the return of Jesus, and then others, such as S, uh, Samuel uh, Perdot Tregellis, was one of the uh, early Plymouth Brethren, he argued, no, the rapture happens when Jesus returns. And so many, many Christians today believe this idea in the pre-tribulational, the rapture that happens before the tribulation, seven years before the return of Jesus. I hold to the post-tribulational uh, perspective, the idea that, the rapture happens. We are transformed, yes, but it happens when Jesus returns. And in fact, when you look at every single statement made by any early church document, um, really for the first several hundred years of the church, there's not a single statement where anyone affirmed a pre-trib rapture. Uh, now, unfortunately, this is an issue that the church is thoroughly uh, divided over and they debated endlessly my primary concern is that people are ready. And so if someone believes in the pre-trib rapture, that's fine. It's not To me, it's a, it's a silly issue to divide over. The issue is pastoral. We need to be ready for all things. It's, it's great to hope for the best, but it's wisdom to be prepared for the worst. And, you know, I certainly hope that I'm wrong. If there's one, if there's one doctrine that I hope I end up being wrong on, it's the issue of the rapture, but I simply don't see it. Uh, in scripture and you talk about in your book uh, about Jacob's trouble in the last days what is that in regards to so in uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 30 you have Jeremiah says can a man give birth to a child and the answer is supposed to be no nowadays occasionally we have some freakish uh, ex ex exceptions, I suppose, but the answer should be no. And then he says, well, then why do I see every man with his hands on his stomach, with his face turned pale, as if he is in labor? And then he says, oh, alas, the day is great. It is the time of Jacob's distress or Jacob's trouble. And then later, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, the angel Gabriel essentially paraphrases the prophet Jeremiah, and he speaks of this time of tribulation such as has never been since there was a nation, nor will there ever be. He says, this is the time of Jacob's distress. And then Jesus actually quotes Gabriel in his all of a discourse, and he, he almost directly quotes Gabriel, and he calls it Jacob's trouble or the great tribulation. And the point is this, is that there is this final period where the Jewish people will go through a tremendous time of suffering before the redemption of all creation. And this is uh, really one of the most terrifying realities of Scripture because it's nearly impossible to get around that there is yet another time of suffering 
primarily, I mean, it's called Jake, Jacob is Israel, Jacob's distress, and it says such as has never happened, which leads us to conclude potentially that something worse than the Holocaust is coming. Now, again, I talked about human nature and denialism. Just 70 years ago, we have evidence of what mankind is capable of. The things that are being spoken throughout the nations today, calling for the genocide of the Jewish people, are a thousand times, they are thousands of times worse than anything that was being spoken coming out of Germany before World War II. You had anti-Semitism in Germany, but it was largely trumpeted from throughout the, the, the Islamic world, across the nations, even across Europe. And we have the scriptures which are warning of, of something terrible that's going to come. And yet, by and large, the church today is doing nothing about it. And I'm convinced that we look back and we, jur we judge the German church for their failures during the Holocaust. And I'm convinced that we ourselves are guilty of denialism and doing nothing for what we have all the evidences that something terrible is coming. And I believe it's going, and this is one of the reasons I don't believe in the preacher of rapture. I believe it's the job of faithful Christians to stand with the Jewish people in their suffering. And the, and the church is going to be persecuted globally too, don't get me wrong. But there is right. going to be a conversation in the wilderness when you know we will all be in flight globally. You know, throughout the nations we'll be in flight and we will have the opportunity to speak to the Jewish people, the sons of Abraham, to explain this is the satanic rage culminating at the end of the age against God's promises of which you are a central focal part of and your calling and your destiny is to be united to your God through your Messiah. And, and this is, I really believe it will be the duty of the church to stand with the Jewish people, not only to protect them and to lay down our lives for them, but to bear witness to the unfolding of the covenantal clash of the ages as that as that's unfolding, and, you know, it really is going to require wisdom and understanding on behalf of the church to be able to communicate uh, many of these deep mysteries. What do you think that Christians should be doing right now along those lines? Well, specifically along those lines, we are to stand up against the demonic propaganda and the lies as they're rising throughout the nations. You know, that's the first and foremost, to stand against the propaganda. Second is to learn how to proclaim the gospel as it was proclaimed by the Jew, by Jesus, by the apostles, because the Jews don't relate to this idea that, oh, you know, Jesus the Messiah died on the cross so that you can be part of the spiritual and visible reality and that the kingdom of Israel is just a spiritual reality and it's here now. That's just such a Greek you know, construct. They can't relate to that. But when you proclaim a restored Jewish kingdom, which is exactly what the scriptures proclaim. They go, oh yeah, that's what I believe. That's what, you know, and, and it makes sense to them. And so we need to learn how to proclaim the good news faithfully, to be able to communicate all of these mysteries in order that Jews can come into relationship with their God again through Yeshua, through Jesus, their Messiah. Because as stand, Christian standing with Israel it has to be more than just political. It's not just, you know, you know, Netanyahu sneezed and we all say hallelujah, it's a matter of standing with the Jewish people primarily with regard to the gospel. And yes, it's right to stand with Israel in light of the growing hatred, to stand against all of those things. But it can't stop there. It has to be, it has to be Gentiles calling the Jewish people back to their own God because that's the only thing that matters you know, when it's all said and done, that's the only thing that's eternal. All of the political stuff is just temporary. So it sounds like that we need to find the commonality between uh, the Jews and the Christians in order to bring them back to God. Because if we start talking about the New Testament and things of that nature, which they, they're they not accustomed to talking about and they don't believe in, correct, then we're not we're not winning them over at that point. Is, is that what I hear you saying? Well, it's not just a matter of, it's not a matter of avoiding the New Testament. It's a matter of handling the New Testament rightly. I'm convinced, and, and really it's demonstrated, it's, it's, you can demonstrate the fact that Christianity has been corrupted 
by an unbiblical worldview, by a Greek philosophical worldview, and, and which has produced replacement theology. It's pro- produced this idea that the, that the hope of the Christian is to someday die and go to heaven forever. Now, yes, if we were to die today, we would, we would be with him in the spirit, but it's, we're still awaiting and longing for the resurrection of the, the reestablishment of the Jewish kingdom. And so it's, it's a matter of purging the Christian message of its, of its, of its Greek philo- philosophical corruption and bringing it back to its Hebraic, biblical uh, you know, worldview. And, and when we do that, then we can relate to a Jew. Say, listen, I am a Gentile who worships the God of Israel. You know, this is, this is very simple, uh, simple. Biblically, this is very simple, but to most Christians, that's a radically foreign concept. Well, and it, I think it's something that's very difficult when you think about, you know, what's coming. And as a Christian, it, it's, it's not something that's easy to digest, if you will. I mean, you know, when you're looking at the Holocaust and how horrible that was, and, and knowing that something, as you've described, is coming that's worse, getting involved is something that's going to be a very hard thing for Christians to willingly want to do. Yeah, I mean, there's no question about it. But, you know, and, and you, you can get off into goofy stuff. There's no question. Application is always important to use wisdom. But I really do believe that now is the time to begin practicing hospitality so that when times get tough, listen, I just came back again from northern Iraq. You've got suddenly millions of people pushed into a part of the country where the only option is for them to live in tents. Well, you know, the, the refugee crisis uh, crises are going to spread all over the earth, and it is going to require Christians to open their homes and create underground railroads and quarry ten boom homes when we're actually hiding people from persecutors and this sort of thing. But it, that's not something you just step into overnight. You begin practicing hospitality now. You begin practicing, you know, all of the things that are required in that day now uh, and, and making that part of a regular lifestyle. But again, Americans were just so thoroughly selfish and individualistic that it's going to be, uh, an extremely difficult jump, and it's why we need to practice, you know, community life and, and laying down our lives and sacrificing for others, all of those things now, basic biblical Christianity 101. And I, I think it's going to also take the churches getting behind that, too, because we've gotten uh, pretty far away in some of the churches away from, you know, focusing on Israel and, and our commitment what it should be, you know, to God's chosen people. And and I think it's going to take that, and it's like you said, it's going to take people learning how to sacrifice uh, for someone else and to serve and to kind of get back to the root. I mean, and there are a lot of Christians who are like that right now. But I think for the majority of people, it, it is going to take a lot to do that. And and we have about two minutes left, and I, I want to give everyone your website. I believe it's joelstrumpet.com. So you can go there and find out more about Joel and his ministry. And if, if they want to support you, I'm assuming that they can do that there as well. Yeah, I've got a link that says partner, and um, that's, that's always very, very helpful. <laughs> well, I know you do a lot of great projects, and you get the word out there. And I think it would be something that if people want to contribute to that. That would be a, a really great thing to do. And I, I hope they will go out and and buy your book, When a Jew Rules the World. I read the book cover to cover. Uh, it really does lay out a lot of information that I think is very valuable and what we really need to know. And, Joel, again, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on again. You know, Please don't be a stranger. Keep us updated, and, and I'd like to have you back again in the future sometime. Okay, yeah, I look forward to uh, I'll certainly be back on sometime. Great. Thank you so much, and you take care. God bless. Okay, bless you, Susan. Thanks again. Thank you. So I think you know the message is pretty clear. We um, we have a lot that's coming, a lot that we need to care for, and probably a lot of things that we need to be reading about and learning for our own selves so that we will be prepared. I'm hoping that Joel is absolutely wrong about the rapture and, and the timing of that. Uh, but as he said, in case that's not uh, that he, he's correct, 
you know, we're going to have to be prepared and it's probably going to call a lot of us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. So, you know, I would suggest uh, that everybody go out and, and, and start serving and start talking to people about the gospel if that's if you're so inclined and feel led to do that and, and start practicing what we know we can do. So I hope that uh, you will come back next week. So glad that you were here. Until next week, be safe and God bless.